Carl said, my name is Matt Vasey. I uh, work inside the um, AI business development team at Microsoft. And so we are really focused on um, how AI, how we can help our customers leverage AI to transform the way they do business. Um, so that's my primary, that's my day job. Um, my afternoon job uh, is I am the chairman and president of the Open Fog Consortium. Yesterday, uh, we put a track on. Some of you attended the track. Um, the Open Fog Consortium is really focused on how do we build edge, uh, edge fabrics that enable AI workloads and, and complex workloads to run at the edge, run near the edge, and also run up in the cloud. And so we, we've spent the last three years, we founded the group three years ago, um, and the, the founding members were Cisco, Intel, Arm, Dell, Microsoft and the Princeton Edge Lab. And today we are now um, up to nearly 60 members uh, globally operating uh, around the world. Um, as part of that work, we drove some standardization of fog computing inside IEEE. Uh, and we developed the standard called um, IEEE 1934. Today, um, about 40 minutes ago, we, um, we announced that we are um, merging with IIC, so you're actually, you guys are the first to find out other than, you know, kind of the, the Twitter sphere. So um, we've been working closely with the uh, Industrial Internet Consortium, which is the largest uh, industrial IoT consortium in the world. Um, we have joined now and we will now be operating in 30 plus countries with um, many hundreds of members uh, around the world, driving fog computing, edge computing, and a whole bunch of uh, industrial uh, IoT workloads. So we're super excited. Uh, about this. We've been working closely with IIC over the last year to, to make this happen. So you guys are the first to know. Thank you, um, you know, for lots of interest, you know, coming by the booth and we'll be in the booth later if you have questions about how you can participate in Open Fog, how you can participate uh, with IIC and, and, um, and whether or not, you know, how you're going to arrange to be um, at our next meeting, which is in Raleigh, in just about two weeks time on the 11th of February. You got that right, Evan. Um, this time versus like saying some other random date, December 7th. Um, no, it's um, February 11th uh, in two weeks time in Raleigh and it'll be the first joint meeting between the IIC and Open Fog and we're going to be like defining the future of fog computing. So, um, you know, thanks for that. Um, if you are not going to be able to make that meeting, you can come to Hanover Mesa, which if you're involved in industrial in internet, I highly recommend you go. It's a great show. Um, you can buy everything from a ball bearing this big all the way down to learning about, you know, the latest, you know, cloud and IoT technology. So a great event. IoT Solutions World Congress in Barcelona in, uh, in Spain um, in the October time frame is another great way. We have a, a presence there and you can come and learn about us there. Or closer to home, Long Beach, California in December. Um, it's warmer than it sounds. Um, we have Fog World Congress, which is the event that Carl um, hosted last year and drove for us. Uh, and we'll be having that event in Long Beach uh, in December. So that's lots of great stuff coming on. So the actual keynote, what I am actually here to talk to you about a little bit is um, Microsoft's view on AI, IoT, and kind of how this new era of computing is, is coming. And um, the, uh, I only have three of, or four of these dots that I have personally worked in. Um, although I, I, my first job was feeding an angry uh, IBM 360, so maybe I did kind of work in that, that first era. Um, the personal computer era was what my company f came out of. Um, our mission at that time was a, uh, you know, a computer on every desktop, uh, and, and we you know, largely have been successful in that era. In the 2000s, um, the mobility era, we actually had multiple computers. I remember my first job, we, we used to share a laptop we had desktops and we shared a laptop and that was like not mobility, that was like trying to figure out who, ha who had it. Um, but through the 2000s, everybody ended up getting mobile computing and that was kind of the next era. Um, and that was combined with um, you being able to surf the web not in text, if anyone remembers surfing the web, getting text results only. Um, you know, in 2000s we solved that problem and then in 2010, which is really what I want to talk about, 2010 on, we started this cloud era. Through from mainframes all the way to the present, a couple of things have remained constant. First, um, all of these applications, whether it be on a mainframe or in a client server environment, um, all of these uh, environments all had three things in common. One, applications taking and acting on data that they were gathering. Data and intelligence 
um, happening either on the device or in some kind of third-party cloud. Um, and that cloud could be kind of a mainframe, it could be a client server kind of environment in the personal computing era, or it, or it could be you know, in the cloud. And finally, thinking about infrastructure. The way um, we believe we are entering kind of a new era of computing, and this next era will be taking these same three components, leveraging AI to create new ways of, uh, of doing work. So, so throughout the kind of presentation, think about these three things, applications, data and intelligence, and infrastructure, and how do we how do we address those kind of levers as we go through faster and faster innovation? So I showed kind of four areas of computing. Since cloud came, there have been um, a number of new waves of innovation. So IoT, which is what this show is all about, started happening. Um, when, I, when I started uh, in IoT, it was called embedded computing, and we worked with machine builders all over the world to put you know, Windows embedded, Microsoft Windows embedded products onto these small devices. They typically weren't that connected. Sometimes they were big, and like an ATM, that is connected. But a lot of these devices would be connected like once and then go out into the field and live for 10, 15 years until they like finally failed and, uh, and, and that was kind of embedded. IoT was the idea that these devices, and I'll show you some of the patterns that we saw, that these devices were connected in some way. And a lot of times that, that pattern was just shipping data northbound and not much happening. Sometimes you will have some kind of reasoning occur in the cloud and, and some action come back down the wire, but in general, that didn't happen. The next phase was edge computing. We've been hearing a lot about edge computing at this show and over the last couple of years, and, and we see that more as kind of a round trip where data comes up, insights are, are built in the cloud, and then those insights travel back down and perhaps live on that device. And then finally, as we get to this era of ubiquity, um, the era of ubiquity is kind of an AI initiative. Right now, we are talking about AI. However, it is not a new thing, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. So um, the market today says $40 billion um, in AI revenue in the next uh, couple of years um, that most enterprises, and actually almost all the enterprises I talk to today um, are using AI or trying to use AI or experimenting or have a plan to. Um, so that's the, the one thing. The, the second piece is now because IoT happened and then the start of edge computing happened, there's a huge amount of data which allows you to do things with um, some of the AI tools that have existed for a long time. Cloud compute and ubiquitous com uh, connectivity. I've actually talked to a lot of operators or telco operators today. Um, this ubiquitous connectivity, which is just getting better and better, and as 5G begins to get rolled out, it's going to get better. Um, th these components have bring us to this inflection point. So if you're not thinking about how AI is going to change your business today, um, then you need to, to do that. Um, I like this chart because it, it talks a little bit about um, when we first started talking about AI going to change the entire world. And, and most people don't realize that it was in 1956 at Dartmouth where we coined the phrase. We had the first AI conference was in 1956. And at that time, most people talked about kind of the Terminator style AI where it's like a, you know, a, a kind of a a digital human that decides it wants to um, you know, take over the earth. And of course, that's a recurring theme. Um, I was actually at an IEEE event last year talking about a, a slightly more technical uh, topic with a lot of PhDs. And, and I got the Terminator question. I always call it the Terminator question. We'll get it today, probably, um, about this. Um, if you saw the movie in the 70s, Demon Seed, which was the computer took over and was like trying to like, replicate itself into life. And then, obviously, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger and his you know, his finest acting ever um, being the Terminator. All of this theme is this kind of constant thought about AI. However, the, the, the path has not been um, all that smooth. In the 70s, um, DARPA, DARPA was spending a ton of money on AI, and then they, we went into what was called the AI winter in the mid-70s, where DARPA decided, you know what, this is never going to work. Uh, it's never going to happen. We're not going to spend any money on that anymore. And it kind of went quiet until IBM decided that they, um, they could um, play chess. They discovered they could play chess. And um, they beat Kasparov. I think it was in, all right, I, I can't read my notes, but I think it was 97. They beat Kasparov at chess, and then the game began. Suddenly, people realized that AI was really going to be doing something. And this is really where machine learning started taking off. And, and um, Microsoft and others started figuring out how can we exceed human capacity in very narrow areas. And so um, Watson obviously beat um, uh, a Jeopardy champion in 2011, and, and a good friend of mine uh, is actually a Jeopardy champion, strange but true. 
um, a knowing person to have dinner with because you can never ask a question that they don't know, they, they don't answer what is the capital of Omaha. But, um, but they were able to be, win in Jeopardy. And then in 2017, Google was able to play Go, which is a hard game even to get through the instructions. There's an app to actually help you understand how to play the game. Um, and they were able to beat a ninth Dan um, Go champion. And in this past uh, 18 months, uh, Microsoft, my research team, has been able to exceed human capacity in listening uh, and in reading. And so um, in very narrow areas, using deep learning, which the, the key difference is you know, uh, neural networks that are modeled on your brain, where you build a computer that is made up of neurons that um, you know, are very similar to your brain. Our model is 152 layers deep, uh, and we can do incredibly um, good predictions of very narrow things today. Over time, we're going to get broader and broader, and we're going to have more and more skills. So this is kind of the, you know, the history of AI, and, I, and so it's not a new thing. But because of this confluence of data ubiquity and, um, and connectivity, uh, th suddenly all of this technology is, gonna, is going to change the way we do things. So now to get kind of a little more um, practical. So what do you do with this? So I, I run a business, let's say, and I want to figure out how do I get AI to enable my business? The first thing that we think about is build a, a feedback loop. And if, if you're involved in manufacturing, you're probably f you know, um, familiar with the idea of product life cycle management. You, you, know, you, you go and you talk to customers, you get some requirements, you start building a product, you iterate on that, and then eventually the product comes through manufacturing, uh, and then you build it, and then you find out what was wrong with it, and then you come back and you build new products. Typically, let's say I bought a lawnmower, a fairly dumb device. It's you know, a motor, a sharp blade, and some kind of a chassis. And I, you know, I run around and it produces uh, clipped grass. That is a very dumb device. Traditionally, with a dumb device like that, the only feedback you got is 1-800, it's not working, or two, somebody ships it back to a store, you end up, as the engineer, getting it back, you tear it apart, and you try to figure out what happened. And that is how the old PLM model worked, is you would come back and do a destructive discovery <laughs> of that device, find out what happened, and then write it down as some kind of root cause, and maybe you change something in manufacturing, or maybe you can't figure it out. What, what we're proposing is to start building digital smart products that start gathering data using IoT telemetry and advanced um, you know, machine learning and deep learning to develop insights about, um, about your product. So the first thing you want to do is you want to collect, um, you want to collect you know, kind of feedback from the customer's usage. So how are they using the lawnmower in this case? Are they using it to, to collect leaves? Uh, which is a different thing than mowing grass. Are they using it in the wintertime, cold weather versus warm weather? Um, does it sit for long periods? You really understand, start understanding that piece. The next piece is understanding operationally what's happening. So if uh, uh, I worked with London Underground and they were trying to fix their people mover uh, infrastructure and, and they really didn't know what was going on with their people mover infrastructure. In fact, they're it's an interesting story. So how London Underground, before they IoT enabled their whole infrastructure, how they found out products were broken is all employees of London Underground were told that when they were coming to work, they were to watch for non-functioning equipment and then dial a phone number and call in the number. They have barcodes. And they're like, it's so simple. They just call in the barcode number. Um, and if you didn't have a London Underground employee on your route and the escalator uh, stopped working, you, could, you learned how to climb stairs. Um, it's a good thing it was in Moscow because it would be much deeper. But, um, but the, the, the reality is, is that you need to be able to get operational data um, and also when somebody goes and services it, have that information tied back into the servicing engine. So you know, oh, we replaced this part, we replaced that part. And typically in a lot of repair things, you don't actually know until the repairman gets there and visualizes the problem. Is that actually a new bearing? Is it an old bearing? A lot of times you open the cabinet of, of, of this type of equipment and you find there's a service record on paper inside the cabinet. And the last guy that was there wrote down what he did. And you look at it and you go, ah, these are, this is what happened. Um, by digitizing that operations information, you get to the next piece. Um, the third piece is, is getting signal from customers, uh, and that could be from social media, but it could also come from the device, and employee feedback, the uh, feedback from the folks that built the equipment and feedback from the folks that are using the equipment. So I used to work at General Motors long ago in a plant building cars, and we gave all kinds of feedback to the engineers because we were you know, working with these vehicles and we knew what was going on and what didn't fit and when things where there was drift in you know, some of the parameters so you know, parts wouldn't fit on the vehicle. 
um, that kind of feedback you need to build into this digital feedback as loop as well. And I hope at GM they did that. Perhaps they did, perhaps they didn't. Um, the result is, you know, basically deeper relationships with your customers because your customers end up feeling like they're part of that product development. Um, the next piece is that you end up being able to feed into your product design this information, and you also find out new ways to sell the product. And in, in fact, you know, what the learning we get from our customers is that, and I'll, I'll do the example with Rolls-Royce, uh, we instrumented their uh, jet engines, uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, how we did that and, and what that looked like. Um, but when you, when you do that, you find new ways of monetizing the products that you sell. And, you know, and that the whole idea of if you're using it to suck up leaves, maybe we need, and you'll see there are these lawnmowers that are actually optimized for sucking up leaves. That was, um, it was not an IoT thing, but that was a discovery that a couple companies made. So, so that's kind of how we think about this. I'll pause and talk about um, you know, the, the intelligent cloud and the intelligent edge and some of the patterns we see. And then when I talk about Rolls-Royce, you can think about which patterns. So the first pattern that we see is kind of this, this you know, edge IoT pattern. And so we talk a lot about this idea of the intelligent cloud. And of course, we're a cloud company, so everyone, that's the obvious one. But we also talk about the intelligent edge. And we see that both of these things are critical. And that's one of the reasons we got so involved with Open Fog, and we're involved with OPC Foundation, and a lot of organizations, because we're trying to make sure that um, this intelligent edge is, is built the right way. But one of the challenges with the intelligent edge today is that there is this northbound latency. If you want to get a secure connection with a cloud service, it's something like 300 milliseconds. If you have a 300 millisecond delay on a light switch, you've already switched the light switch off again by the time the lights start, by the time the signal's coming down the wire. And then you switch it again, and you get to this thing where you're switching it on and off, because 300 milliseconds is too long. The second piece is that east-west con connectivity in this intelligent edge with today's infrastructure is difficult. The patterns that, um, from an IoT perspective that we see um, in this case are, you have a thing out in the field, it's connected to some kind of device management, it passes information back, you develop some insights, and then um, you push the insight back down to that device. The classic example of this, a thermostat. The thermostat measures the temperature in the house. It sends that to the cloud. It looks at the cloud. There's a setting that says that you're either you know, too high, too low, and you get this really slow PID loop that um, you, know, you send an action back down. It says, turn the furnace on for a while and keep sending me information about the temperature of the house. And that is a common IoT pattern. And it is, um, it, it's serviceable, but it's, it's not great. Enter 5G and new connectivity, we will see a couple of things happen. The, this north-south latency between an edge device and the cloud will move from 300 that, if you listen to the, the makers of network hardware, perhaps as low as 70 milliseconds. You will have east-west communication that is near real-time, say 10 milliseconds. Uh, if I have any kind of industrial engineers, they'll claim that that is not real-time, and it, and it is not. But it is near real-time. Um, and also this idea of having an edge fabric where you have um, FPGA, GPU resources, like so, uh, hardware acceleration resource exposed at the edge so you can see those resources. You understand network connectivity, storage, compute, all these things at the edge. You can actually start pushing very complex workloads. And what that enables is a pattern that looks like this. So you remember the first pattern. You have a thing and now I've got kind of a more advanced thing. It's an engine that's instrumented. It sends telemetry north and it gathers insights in the same way that my first pattern did. But the difference here is that when you have a fabric at the edge that can run advanced workloads, that you can take the models, the, the AI models, that you learn from this telemetry and push it down to the device. And that device now can run AI on a workload and look for anomalies in an engine, or it can watch for patterns, in a, patterns of heat in a bearing, or whatever it is that you're monitoring, you can start doing this. So as you take this idea and you now think about telco, and operator architecture. And you'll see I've got this kind of intelligent edge, the, the edge of that diagram, and you have this um, kind of telco infrastructure. So the blue wedge is Microsoft. We have you know, significant data centers all around the world. We have city letter level data centers, and we have CDN caching nodes right near the edge of the network. When you look at the operator, which is this kind of red triangle, they can now take, using fog computing and you know, kind of the, the, you know, the standardization work from 1934 at, at IEEE, and start m putting compute and other resources down through their network and expose that fabric in ways that reduce the latency and improve the ways that they can deliver service. 
And one of the big challenges today with 5G is that if you're a small operator, um, and I grew up in a, in a place where the, the, te the telephone system had probably less than 12,000 customers. So any new technology does not get to a place that has 12,000 customers. Um, we were like, you know, I remember talking to the phone guy, and he's like, yeah, but you can still get dial phones. I mean, that's the perfect thing, you know. I was like, perfect. Uh, just what I need. In case of nuclear war, my phones will work. Um, but the... Um, in small operators in Europe, they look at the 5G expense and they say, well, it's, it's, I'm going to spend this ton of money on the downstroke, and how do I monetize it? And so we think that, you know, fog computing and being able to run these advanced workloads down in this converged network is a way that you could start monetizing that investment and improving, um, improving the kind of connectivity experience for everybody. So that's kind of our vision. Um, this is... Uh, in, in reality, this is not here yet today. The blue stuff, like our data centers are there. I think the operators are looking at building, um, building out this kind of red, uh, red area. Uh, and, and we're hopeful. We, we see lots of momentum there. And certainly the number of 5G um, exhibitors at this show show that there's a lot of momentum there. Um, use cases, and I'll talk a little bit about Rolls-Royce. Um, use cases, um, there's all kinds. You, if you've come to a Microsoft talk before, you've heard us talk about the connected cow, where we designed a bovine Fitbit we could watch the cow walk around, and we could tell when the cow was ready um, to ovulate, and so you could improve the yield, um, you know, of cattle. That's kind of a, an, an interesting, and, and kind of you'll, you'll never get that image out of your mind again, but a cow with the Fitbit. But um, working with autonomous cars in this, in this environment, where cars are communicating with each, other, with each other as they travel through the network, these are all great examples where fog computing with this kind of new, with these new patterns makes a ton of sense. But one that I want to talk about uh, in particular uh, is Rolls-Royce. And so we work closely with Rolls-Royce, and in, in, since most of us flew here, probably a third of us flew here with a Rolls-Royce engine um, powering the aircraft that you, you traveled here in. We worked with them. They wanted to change the way they did business. Traditionally, they sell to, um, a, a, to a carrier uh, an engine, and then the, the carrier specs that engine to Boeing or whoever's building their jet. Um, and they get that engine, so you can order most jets with a variety of engines. And so they would come and say, you want to buy my Rolls-Royce engine because it's the strongest, the fastest, the most fuel efficient. When you start thinking about a digitally transformed jet engine, you need to start thinking about different things. It's just not about fuel efficiency, although very important. So we work with them to build, and this is a dashboard that uh, we built with them. Um, they built the kind of first flying fog node uh, where you have a, an engine, and I had it at our show in Hanover two years ago, and you could stand inside it and still reach up. It's that big. Um, it's like the biggest, heaviest fog node ever, and it's got a compute module on the top of it that's running AI models, watching the thousands of sensors and the just, you know, terabytes of data that are flowing off this machine every few minutes, watching that motor run. And so this here, and I'm going to commit the cardinal sin of using a laser pointer, but uh, it's, this is such a busy slide. So you can see this is all the aircraft that are running these engines and all the telemetry that's coming back off of them. You're watching fuel efficiency across that entire workload. You are looking at um, kind of on-time performance. So this is pulling in data from um, FAA and other traffic, uh, flight traffic control. It's also looking at when maintenance is due, looking at flight scheduling, and it also provides this kind of watch list here. And that is in, uh, airplanes that are running close to, um, s close to some of the parameters uh, where they need service. So if we double click, there's actually a red aircraft here in Frankfurt. Oops, I should laser pointer here. Here in Frankfurt that is hard to see. Um, if we double click down on that device, you actually see that device. You can um, get a sense of what's going on with it. And you can see its fuel efficiency. Um, and you can understand what's going on with that. Double click again, you can go right inside that engine and you can see that this is the engine um, that is, that is throwing, throwing the problem. And it's starting to get just below or near that recommended for flight line. The fog, these are points where it is sending, the fog node that's on the engine is sending back telemetry across the entire transatlantic flight to Frankfurt. And so they have data points, detailed data points for each of these. So let's click in on one of these data points and you can actually see the engine, understand where it is. So you have to wash these engines every 100 hours or so. And they actually literally do some kind of fancy power washing to clean the engines out. So you look at the engine and you say, it's not performing well. Its performance is only at 92%. It's only halfway through the fuel wash cycle. Um, it's got half the life remaining. So the engine's not end of life, but there's still something going on with it. Because look at the fuel efficiency change. And so in real time, it is watching what happened. And somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, 
uh, something happened inside the engine. So you can actually double click, and they actually have called out, I think it's the fuel pump. There's a warning on this. So you double click again down into that engine. Now you're getting telemetry that's coming right off a of fuel pump. And what is clear is you see the fuel pressure is low. It's down in the yellow on this one fuel pump in this ginormous engine. It's like a 60 pound part. I've seen this. It's like, it's a big part. Um, but you, <coughs> excuse me, but you look and you see, ah, something's happened because the valve positioning was correct or near correct all through here and then suddenly something happened and the valve position jumped into the red and the fuel efficiency went off. And because these systems are all tied in with the enterprise systems, we actually can take a look at this and say, is there a part um, locally that can s fix this problem? Do they have one of these fuel pumps? Is there a mechanic there that's capable to do it? And take a look at the, um, the time that the airplane's on the ground to find out if we are able to do it uh, in the time that the airplane's on the ground so you don't interrupt service. And so what's revolutionary about this is that um, typically what would happen is you wait till the thing breaks or it goes into the red zone and then you have an emergency and you try to figure out, well, you know, do we have other equipment? Um, can we fix it now? We're just going to make people wait. I spent, I got stranded in Hawaii a couple of years ago for two days waiting for a part to come from Seattle and that was okay. But, um, but getting stranded in, in Frankfurt is not so appealing. Um, so, so you're able to reduce those kinds of interruptions by being able to be planful. And you might say, hey, we could fly this to Paris, and there is a mechanic there, and there is a part there, and the airplane is safe to do that. So that's kind of how we're thinking. When you think about a, a real use case, and this is actually up and flying, we demonstrated this um, a while back, and this is an actual operational system that Boeing, or that, uh, that Rolls-Royce uses um, to kind of show how they have transformed the engine. So that, that is um, kind of the demo that I was going to show is, is kind of what we, what we recommend. Matt, thank you. Give him a round, round of applause, applause, please, for my basic. Thank you. Thank you, Carl.